Solving general chemistry problems, thermodynamics. Ammonium chloride is a solid that can decompose into two gaseous compounds, ammonia and hydrochloric acid. Does it do this at room temperature under standard conditions? The answer, it turns out, is no. So then we might ask, well then, at what temperature does it start to decompose, if at all? The answer to this next question is, yes, it does decompose at high temperatures, and it will start to do so above about 349 degrees Celsius. What about another question? Does acetylene react with nitrous oxide under standard conditions at room temperature? If so, it would form carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen. In this case, the answer is yes. Is this obvious to you? Likely most of us are more like this young woman. So how do we answer questions like this? In learning about entropy, the second law provides a profound insight into the cause of the directionality of processes. We observed that for spontaneous processes, ones that go in the forward direction as we have chosen to write it, the entropy of the universe would always increase, or at best remain unchanged in the special case of a reversible process. This entropy change of the universe was the sum of the entropy change of the system and the entropy change in the surroundings. While the system change and the surroundings change can both be either positive or negative, the second law assured us that the sum would always be positive for a spontaneous process. Scientists look for an approach that would focus on just the system rather than dealing directly with surroundings and the rest of the universe as well. One scientist, Willard Gibbs, provided the way forward. Restrict our discussion to isothermal and isobaric, which is constant temperature and pressure, processes. Also let the surroundings be at the temperature T. Because delta P equals zero, the heat of the system is the system's enthalpy change. This heat leaves or enters the system depending upon the sign, and the exact same heat must enter or leave, reverse sign, the surroundings. The entropy change of the surroundings is the negative of the system enthalpy change divided by the temperature. Substitute this into the entropy expression above. Now we can multiply through by T to get T delta S universe equals T delta S system minus delta H system. We switch the signs around, multiply through by minus one to get minus T delta S universe equals delta H system minus T delta S system. Everything on the right hand side is related to the system only. On the left hand side, we have the change in entropy of the universe, which is the criterion for spontaneous change. We rename the left hand side delta G system, the change in Gibbs energy. G is known as the Gibbs function, also known as Gibbs energy or as Gibbs free energy. The Gibbs function is defined as G equals H minus T S. H, T and S are all state functions, so G is also a state function of the system. We often drop the system subscript since there's no longer any ambiguity. We can just focus on the system. Delta G, Delta H, Delta S can now all refer to the system. And from these, we can derive all that we can know about how a process will proceed. Compare how Delta G relates to Delta S universe and note the change in sign. A spontaneous process, a reaction goes in the forward direction as written, must have Delta S universe greater than zero which implies that delta G for the same process must be less than zero. Delta G is negative for a spontaneous process. A spontaneous process is one which decreases a system's Gibbs function. Because of the definition for G, that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, if we know the change in any two of the state functions at a temperature T, we can easily calculate the third. Like enthalpy, thermodynamic tables use the same defined zero for delta G, the elements in their standard states. Tables generally give all three, G, H, and S, but it is redundant because of the defined connection between the three. We only have to have two, for instance, delta H and S, but we are usually given all three just to expedite matters. Thermodynamic tables give us the standard Gibbs energy of formation of a substance, the standard enthalpy of formation of a substance, and the absolute entropy for that substance. These are all the values calculated at a specific temperature. Commonly it is 298.15 Kelvin, but it could also be 273.15 Kelvin or any value chosen. The table would have to specify that. Recall that formation is the reaction which has all of the necessary elements in their standard states 
reacting to form the product, which is the tabulated substance of interest. The phrase standard states means the physical state, gas, liquid, or solid, of the substance, elemental or compound, that is most stable at the temperature being discussed. By contrast, standard conditions means that all reaction participants, reactants, products, are all present at standard conditions of one bar pressure, one molar concentration, or as pure liquid or pure solid as appropriate for each substance. Note how G and H have to refer to a formation reaction, but entropy is the absolute value. This difference in zero is not a problem because we are always dealing with changes in the values. No matter where the zero happens to have been assigned, the differences will always be the same. The Gibbs energy is pertinent for a process at constant temperature and pressure. And this is very common. A reaction in a beaker on the bench top is one instance. Additionally, every chemical reaction in our bodies is also at constant temperature and pressure. And for this reason, general chemistry focuses on Gibbs energy. It is worthwhile mentioning, however, that at constant temperature and volume, think of a sealed container at this point, the equivalent state function is called Helmholtz energy. But we do not deal with that in general chemistry. Here is a table that outlines how a change in Gibbs energy correlates with reaction spontaneity. The increasing entropy of the universe is generally applicable. At constant T and P, we can use the decrease in Gibbs energy for the equivalent assessment. I listed Helmholtz energy just for completeness sake. Chemists use the symbol A for Helmholtz. It comes from the German Arbeit for work. Physicists use F. It's okay, we can forgive them. Decreasing free energy, whether Gibbs or Helmholtz, characterizes a spontaneous process, just as does the increase in the entropy of the universe. There is an additional skill you want to develop, and that is being able to estimate whether a particular reaction will be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. The first step is to be able to do an estimation without doing any calculations. Look at the definition of delta G. The criterion for spontaneity is for delta G to be negative. If we know the signs of delta H and delta S, we can draw the following conclusions. If delta H is negative, that will contribute to a negative delta G. If delta S is positive, then the term minus T delta S will also contribute to delta G being negative. Therefore, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, delta G will always be negative, and as such, a reaction will always be spontaneous. By contrast, if delta H is negative but delta S is negative, then the minus T delta S term will be positive and might swap the delta H term and make delta G positive. This would only happen if T was sufficiently large. So without knowing the precise values for delta H and delta S, we can at least conclude that at a sufficiently low temperature, T small enough so that minus T delta S is small enough to not overwhelm the negative delta H, then the reaction will be spontaneous. However, if T is sufficiently large, again, which depends on the actual values of delta H and delta S, the reaction will become non-spontaneous. This table encapsulates the four possible conditions. Note how there are two conditions where the reaction does not change with temperature, negative positive and reaction always goes for forward. Positive, negative, and reaction never goes forward. The reverse reaction is always spontaneous. The other con two conditions have spontaneity either at low temperature or high temperature. Knowledge of the signs alone for delta H and delta S allow us to draw some general conclusions about the reaction direction. Having the values for those variables allows a calculation of the temperature when the reaction direction changes. So now go back to the questions posed at the beginning of the video. First, the decomposition of ammonium chloride. We now know that the answer lies in knowing the Gibbs energy change for the reaction. We go to the thermodynamic tables and obtain the Gibbs energy change of the formation processes for each substance. Those values are minus 203.9, minus 16.7, and minus 95.3 all in kilojoules per mole. The Gibbs energy change for the reaction is just the products minus reactants calculation of the Gibbs energy of formation for the reaction participants. So it's minus 16.7 plus a minus 95.3 minus a negative 203.9, which equals plus 91.9 kilojoules per mole. 
because it is positive, the reaction is not spontaneous at this temperature, which right, 25 degrees Celsius. And under these standard conditions, each species at one bar pressure. Now this is what the superscript not on the G requires. The next question asked if this reaction could be made to be spontaneous at elevated temperatures. So how do we determine that? In this case, we need to the standard enthalpy change for the reaction and the standard entropy change for the reaction. Those values are found in the tables to be as follows. So we calculate the standard enthalpy change and entropy change for the reaction. Again, it is just products minus reactants. We obtain plus 176.9 kilojoules per mole for the standard enthalpy change and plus 284.3 joules per kelvin mole for the standard entropy change. Again, note the difference in units. Note the kilojoules compared to the joules and the per kelvin mole compared to per mole. Recall the last table we looked at. There, a positive delta H and a positive delta S implied that a reaction would be spontaneous at a high enough temperature. Clearly for this reaction, room temperature is not high enough. But what would that temperature be when it starts to go forward? Look again at the definition of the change in the Gibbs function, delta G naught equals delta H naught minus T delta S naught. If you stick 298.15 Kelvin in for the temperature, you get the result above we found by using Gibbs energy of formation. There's a slight difference just used in rounding off values in our calculations. Look at the equation. Both delta H and delta S are positive. As T gets bigger, the T delta S term will get bigger too. And as it does so, the delta G term will become smaller and smaller. When T is big enough that delta G becomes zero, then any higher temperature will make it negative and the reaction will be sp uh, spontaneous. Find the value of T for which delta G is zero. Just rewrite the equation to solve for T and find that T is equal to 622 Kelvin or 349 degrees Celsius. The second question asked about the reaction between acetylene and nitrous oxide. We look up the st standard Gibbs energy of formation for each species. And then we do a products minus reactants. Don't forget the stoichiometry of the reaction. We find a Gibbs energy change for the reaction to be minus 1744.4 kilojoules per mole. This reaction is very spontaneous. When a reaction has a negative change in Gibbs energy, we say it is exergonic. Similarly, a reaction with a negative enthalpy of reaction is exothermic. By contrast, a reaction with a positive Gibbs energy is called endergonic. The reaction of acetylene with nitrous oxide is very exergonic. This answer is applicable at room temperature, 298.15 Kelvin. How does it change with temperature? For that, we need the change in enthalpy and in entropy for the reaction. We look that data up in tables. Here it is. We again use products minus reactants, find the changes for this reaction. The reaction enthalpy change is minus 1348.5 kilojoules per mole. It's a very exothermic reaction. The reaction entropy change is plus 272.6 joules per kelvin mole. It's a very end entropic reaction. By referring back to that table, we see that a negative positive enthalpy entropy reaction will be spontaneous at all temperatures. One more thing to observe in these calculations. We are assuming that delta H and delta S do not change with temperature. We use the same value whether we use a temperature of 298.15 Kelvin or a temperature of 622 Kelvin or any other temperature. And this is really not the case. They do change with temperature. We know how to calculate this. The data is available, but it does add a lot of calculation. And this risks confusing students who are just starting on in the subject. So in general chemistry, we make the assumption that delta H and delta S do not depend upon temperature, and we just use the equation delta H minus T delta S to find delta G. And that seemed to depend explicitly on temperature. The T is right there in the equation. Here is another approach to these questions. Very often, one just wants to know if the reaction will proceed forward or not. Look at this reaction. It is the combustion of propane. It is useful to remember that the combustion of hydrocarbons is always an exothermic reaction. Because of that knowledge, we know that delta H is negative. In addition, we can look at the reaction. Note that on the reactant side, there are six gas phase molecules, and on the product side, there are seven.
We know that gas phase molecules have a lot more entropy than solids or liquids. And so we have six gas phase molecules becoming seven gas phase molecules. We can conclude that the entropy change is positive. Recall the table or think through the definition of delta G again. We can predict that the reaction will be spontaneous at all temperatures.